this um, series of talks is called Crafting the Unexpected. And I decided to talk about a time when I think I did craft the unexpected. Well, it was highly unexpected for me anyway. It was uh, made for TV. And I just thought it was the most exciting and sensational idea. I, none of us had the slightest premonition of what was going to happen. And she told me the idea of it being sort of kind of war of the worldsy. I mean, I remember being terrified when this bloody great big red blodge appeared in the studio. Now, the whole reaction from within the BBC, particularly the press department, will be different. They would be dancing with joy. And I'll bet you there are people who are out there writing and directing stuff now as a direct consequence of that show. As a director, when the boat leaves the harbour, you know, you just think, is it going to float? And that's all you want to know is, is it, you know, is, is it going to float? Is someone going to see it? So what I'd like to do is um, actually take you back almost exactly 20 years to Halloween night, 1992. Um, imagine that you're sitting at home, maybe with a remote, remote control in your hand, you're wondering what to watch around about 9.15 at night, and you happen upon BBC One at 9.25 to be exact, and you see Michael Parkinson presenting a program called Ghost Watch. And um, he introduces you to the main players in the outside broadcast you're about to watch. Um, and he says this is going to be an unprecedented experiment by the BBC into the paranormal. For one night only, this Halloween night, we are going to send the cameras into the most haunted house in England with the prospect of catching a ghost. And he introduces you to Sarah Green, who you saw on screen there, a kind of roving reporter who is at the house in Northolt in Middlesex. And um, she's with the family in the haunted house. Um, there's a man called Alan Demescu, who is a parapsychologist. He has all his technology in what they call a scanner truck, which is an outside broadcast truck on the location. There's um, Craig Charles, the comedy actor, recently seen in Coronation Street, but also known as one of the main characters in Red Dwarf. He is on the streets talking to the neighbors about the strange happenings um, on Fox Hill Drive in recent months. And back in the studio, we have Michael Parkinson as the anchor man for the night. We have a, a, pa a parapsychologist expert in the supernatural and the paranormal called Dr. Lynn Pascoe. She's with um, Parky. And we also have Mike Smith, who is, as many of you will know, is uh, Sarah Green's real life husband. He's actually monitoring the phones in the studio because Parky has asked the viewing audience to phone in with their own ghost stories during transmission. So we kind of hunker down to watch this. We are introduced through Sarah Green to the family who live in Fox Hill Drive, um, a woman called Mrs. Early and her two um, uh, daughters who've been plagued by poltergeist manifestations over the last several months, making their life hell. Uh, and the, the, the two small children have, because uh, it manifests as knocking in the radiators, they've taken to calling this ghost pipes. And um, the program continues. Actually, someone then rings in to say, you know when you've, you showed that footage earlier on in the girl's bedroom from a few months ago, I'm sure I saw a figure standing against the curtains in the corner there. And Parky says, with his usual kind of Barnsley cynicism, well, we'll, we'll wind back the footage and have another look at that, but I didn't, I didn't see anything. They bring in the technology, they have a look at the footage of the little girl's bedroom. No, I don't see anything, do you, Dr. Pascoe? And the parapsychologist says, no, I don't see anything standing there. But of course, there is something standing there. So we at home think, WTF, what the hell's going on? Um, because in fact, this isn't an outside broadcast live from a haunted, the most haunted house in England. It's a drama which was written by me and produced through the drama department of the BBC and is going out pretending to be live on Halloween night. So, back in the house, things start to get a little more tense, a little more scary. Um, 
communication with the house breaks down, so the people in the studio can't talk to the people in the house, they don't really know what's going on, though we can see some of it through an infrared camera. Um, the lights go down, they start to feel very cold, the dangling apples of Halloween start shaking, etc., etc. We see reflections, we see pipes in the corner of the room, in the mirror, wherever. Uh, things go from bad to worse, people get hysterical. Sarah Green ends up locked up with the ghost in the little room under the stairs, and in the final shot, Michael Parkinson seems to be possessed by the soul of a child killer from Victorian times. <laughs> and we cut to black, the end. So, where was I when all this was going on? Well, on transmission night, I was in Chelsea Yacht Club because we were having a party. We had a party with the cast and crew, and um, we watched it all go out as it did go out. And as it ended, the producer, Ruth Baumgarten, arrived because she was back at Television Center monitoring the telephones. Or because we had a number on the screen, people to ring in with their ghost stories. What she came to report was, with a rather kind of ashen face, there have been rather a lot of complaints tonight. So I kind of chuckled and I was kind of, great. And then she said, no, no, really, there have been a lot of complaints. People are very angry. And, you know, the proverbial is at the fan. Um, well, in the event, there have been 30,000 complaints. <laughs> the, uh, the phone lines of the BBC were jammed. Uh, let me think of a selection of one few of the things that happened. Um, a vicar in the subsequent days said that even though it was explained to him it was a drama and a hoax, he thought we'd nevertheless conjured up genuinely demonic forces. Um, three women who were pregnant that night went into labor through being shocked. Um, in Bradford and Avon, the woman in the off-license, when I went in on the Sunday night, said, I've got a bone to pick with you. My son couldn't sleep last night. And um, my favorite one was a letter sent to the producer uh, by a woman whose husband was a, um, a die-hard veteran of the, the Falklands conflict, and he was so scared watching the program that he'd literally pooed his pants. <laughs> and she was writing to get compensation to buy him a new pair of jeans. <laughs> Um, so what happened the next day? On the Sunday morning, we were staying with friends in, in London. This is the night after the, what we call the rap party. We started to see the tabloids, the news of the world, uh, the mail on Sunday started to come out. Had that wonderful headline, Heads Must Roll at the BBC, which, you know, every writer craves like mad. Um, it said, uh, Parky drops a ghoulie. That was in the sun, I think. My favorite one was actually later in the week and it was in Private Eye which described the whole thing as a parky normal experience. <laughs> um, as I say, the following week it really started to kick off. Sarah Green, last seen disappearing under the stairs with pipes, uh, had to appear on children's TV to say no, she wasn't dead, no, she hadn't been uh, uh, gobbled up by the ghost. Um, we had uh, a lot of complaints appeared on Points of View with Anne Robinson, so that was, you know, I was quite chuffed at that actually to get um, you know Anne Robinson with the usual kind of like um, snarling expression uh, condemning it was quite nice and there was this program uh, called Bite Back which um, Sue Lawley presented which was entirely put over to um, uh, Ghost Watch uh, and the, the two producers were there a little bit like with deep respect a bit like rabbits in the headlights facing all this vitriol from um, the audience so uh, and well, as a result of all that hoo-ha, the BBC have really kind of buried it and it hasn't been seen or even talked about by the BBC officially for the last 20 years and it's kind of the 20th year anniversary now which is why I wanted to share it with you. Um, how did it all come about? Well, I pitched it to the BBC, the producer that, that I met there called uh, Ruth Baumgarten. Uh, initially it was going to be a conventional drama. Um, and a fragment of that drama series was a kind of idea of taking cameras into a haunted house. And uh, when the BBC balked at the idea of an entire six-part series of a supernatural drama, ghost story type thing, she said, could we do it as a single? So I said, well, could we do the last part, which is the transmission from a haunted house, but what if we did it as if it is a transmission from a haunted house, like a kind of a War of the Worlds type effect? And her jaw dropped and she said, do you think we can do that? And I said, well, let, let's, let's try. Um, and I think what, she, what was unexpressed between us in that was, um, I think we both felt it caught something of the time. If you can think back, those of you that, that, that are, are, are 
of an age to think back to the early 90s, that it was really the kind of foothills of reality TV. And we felt very much that, um, that documentaries, as they were called then rather than reality TV, things like, say, Rescue 999 were starting to recreate incidents, accidents, car accidents, or drownings, that kind of thing, using actors, using music, and drama techniques. On the other hand, dramas were using increasingly documentary techniques, handheld cameras, like shows like NYPD Blue. And the, la the distinct language between fact and fiction on TV, which uh, beforehand was separate, was now becoming blurred together. So it seemed a natural time for us, I think, subtextually to our thinking, to do something which literally pretended to be true but wasn't true. So I think that was kind of in the ether, in the air of our thinking. Um, I've kind of put on record, really, that my two intentions in writing Ghost Watch were, one, to do a ghost story for television that frightened people in the way that I used to love the ghost stories for Christmas, the adaptations of Dickens and M.R. James that the BBC used to do almost every year, I think, in the 70s. And uh, a marvellous ghost story, I think, in the 80s, which was uh, written by Nigel Neal called The Stone Tape, which, again, involved technology and and the kind of tropes that Nigel Neal was very interested in the, in the Quatermass um, things that he, he wrote and other science fiction. Um, I was very besotted by the idea of doing something for television because television, unlike a horror movie where you buy money and you go to see a film, the contract is, I'm going to be frightened. But television is, is piped, if you forgive the impression, is piped into your home. You, 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 get, you get given it. You don't go out seeking it. And that's a very different kind of transaction to the movie experience. That's what intrigued me about the idea of scaring people in TV. Um, the other thing that was very interesting to me, uh, again, a, a kind of um, prescient thing with regard to reality TV, and that is I wanted the audience to have a culpability about what they're watching. Uh, the whole structure of Ghost Watch is about the audience there because they want to see a ghost. And all the build-up and tension and suspense is about we really want to see this ghost, we want something to happen. We don't care that people on screen are being scared, we don't care that these kids are terrified. So how far are we prepared to go for our own vicarious pleasure? So it's kind of a, I think you can see that's a kind of prescient idea with, with regard to some of the reality TV that we kind of see now. The other thing what I wanted to say was the very thing that annoyed people and got them angry was it, uh, it kind of flaunted or fl flaunted, uh, it kind of like, uh, it was all about the, the trust in the BBC. That's why they got annoyed and they felt they were being made mugs of because they trust the BBC. Um, but of course, as a drama, the whole um, theme of it was about trust. It was about, do I trust what Parkinson's telling me? Do I trust what that expert is telling me? Do I trust the BBC? Do I trust the media? Do I trust the news? And of course, as a ghost story, ultimately, do I trust what I, what I can see? Um, and I like the way that the, the theme of the ghost story actually filtered into its theme as a piece of satire about uh, the media, in a sense. Um, I think it's opposite that every draft of the script had an epigraph at the front which was a quote by um, Terry Waite's brother. When Terry Waite, the hostage, was released from Iraq, Terry Waite's brother on the news said, I believe it when I see it on TV. And I think Ghostwatch was about what are we prepared to believe on TV? Anyway, as I say, the BBC buried it um, and pretended in a rather Stalinist way that it hadn't really happened or preferred to pretend it hadn't happened. Um, the impression at the time was almost entirely kind of negative, a kind of tsunami of negativity. But when the BFI decided to bring out um, a DVD in 2002, the 10 year anniversary, and Ruth and myself and the director, Leslie Manning, were enabled to do an audio commentary, um, not only could we put our, our feelings in the commentary about our intentions and about what we're trying to achieve, but also what happened was a lot of fans kind of came out of the woodwork at that point, being 10 years older, a lot of them maybe teenagers or even children at the time. And what I found was that a lot of these fans subsequently came up at me at uh, uh, festival screenings or sometimes film students would have screenings of Ghost Watch. Uh, and a lot of them would come up and say, yes, I, was, I didn't sleep for a week, but it was the best program I think the BBC has ever done, that kind of thing. Not, not uh, bragging about it, but just quoting them. Um, and um, I'm kind of surprised that nobody's really come up to me with a meat cleaver and said, 
you swine, I'm going to get my revenge on you for this. They kind of said, yes, you scared us witless, but we enjoyed being scared. And of course, the horror genre is all about being enjoyed, being scared, and, and, and crafting the unexpected, so to speak. Um, so I've enjoyed its kind of new lease of life on the internet, where there are fans, there are websites. The guy, one of the, the, our most ardent fans is a guy called Rich Lorden, who has produced the... Um, documentary about the making of Ghost Watch that we saw the trailer of there. Um, and he's been absolutely marvelous in getting those interviews together. And um, hopefully that will be released, who knows when. Um, but it's just recently, luckily we got um, uh, permission to use that uh, trailer to show you today. Um, what's the legacy of Ghost Watch? Well, I'd say you could see it maybe in the Blair Witch Project. Um, you could certainly see uh, the style of it in things like Most Haunted. Um, you can see it in their use of infrared camera, which seems almost ubiquitous in kind of so-called paranormal TV shows now, of which there are dozens, if not hundreds, you know, proliferating on uh, channels like um, Living TV and that kind of thing. Um, but also I think it's a direct influence on something like paranormal activity. Um, in fact, I saw a quote where the director acknowledged Ghostwatch and said that it should, you know, be distributed uh, more widely because it was a big influence on that film, which is now a huge franchise. And in fact, the whole style of found footage horror is almost all you see now in the horror genre in, in the multiplexes. So what do I think now 20 years later? Um, to be honest, I'm proud that it kind of ruffled some feathers and rattled some cages and it occupies a little dark, dingy corner of television history. Um, Kim Newman on the documentary that the broadcaster and critic, he said, how many programs do we really remember from October 1992? Not many, but uh, he's, he said Ghostwatch was one of them. So I, he's, a, he's a big horror aficionado, so I'm very uh, pleased at that. Um, I'd like to think, to be honest, that TV writers would applaud or agree with me that television isn't just there in the corner of the room to make us feel comfortable or comforted. It's sometimes there to challenge us, to challenge our preconceptions, to be provocative about what we think we know and what we presume. Um, and I think, finally, to be honest, I'd just like to round off by saying that, uh, by quoting uh, one of my friends and kind of mentors in a way, the horror writer, Ramsey Campbell, he says, he says, horror is sometimes the business of going too far. That's what we try to do. Thanks very much.